Hi everyone, today it is my pleasure to interview Adriana Tika and we talk about SaaS content marketing, we'll talk about strategy and implementation of content marketing. Welcome to the show Adriana. Hi Natalie, it's a pleasure to be here. So you've been in the field for many years. Tell yes. us, how did you get started working with SaaS companies? It was a natural transition, I think. As a marketer, I, I, I worked for tech companies as a marketing manager, and then I started moving on to freelancing. I, at first, I did uh, all sorts of gigs in all sorts of industries, but then I realized that I, I need to go back to tech because that was definitely my passion. And uh, SaaS is the niche that I'm, I'm most focused on. It's uh, the type of company that I enjoy working with the most because... Um, the growth you see in this field, the, the speed with which it's happening and the things you can do to help with that growth are, are absolutely unparalleled. So content marketing strategy, just content marketing in general is pretty interesting area of opportunity because I feel like so many founders do not pay closer attention to that. And any step of a startup journey it's important, right? And I hear so many founders talk about, okay, I, 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 I'm just launching my product and I want to do a pay-per-click, for example. But then they don't have an understanding of their audience, uh, who they are, what they talk about, the terms that they use. So I feel like it's like from the very beginning till the very end, right? Like it's very important. What do you see as far as, con if, as, far as the content strategy? What do you, what do you see? Well, um, you're definitely right. Content marketing is uh, crucial in every step of, uh, of a SaaS, even, even before you launch, because uh, content marketing can help you create uh, a certain buzz that no other channel can. And um, you actually said something very interesting, interesting about getting to know your audience. I think this is where most startup founders are, okay, maybe not most, but a, a whole lot of them start off on the wrong foot because they start to put out content they 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 write these amazing blog posts at, at times but they they write it for themselves and you can see that you can you can read between the lines and see that they do not know their their audience if you if you start by researching your uh, buyer persona in depth then you know exactly what to say and more importantly how to say it and i think this this phase is crucial for every marketing tactic not just content marketing because if you, uh, if you take the time to research your buyer persona and understand what their needs are and how you can help in, in meeting those needs, then, uh, then you set yourself up for success. Otherwise, you're just making educated guesses and uh, you're bound to get it wrong, you know? And what's amazing is that now we have these amazing tools that, that can help us uh, get to know our buyer persona. And most of them are SaaS, actually, you know? So you can, you can send out surveys, you can ask people via social media, you can simply ask, what do you need? What, to, what other tools you use? What are the, the areas of your work that you need the most help with? And then all you have to do is look for patterns, you know, tools that, are, that, are, that people are constantly repeating or problems that a lot of uh, people in your, in your target audience are facing. As soon as you have those patterns defined, then you can create one or more uh, buyer personas because you don't, you don't really need to have a single buyer persona. But what you need to do is, is make sure that you, you understand them and that, that you always, always ask why. Why do you need this? Why is it important to you? Because in those very answers, you, you don't just find the core of your strategy, but actually part of your content marketing. Because when, when people say, for instance, I struggle a lot with the social media in my day-to-day -day work because it takes up a lot of time and you, see that, and you see this repeating as a pattern in all your interviews and surveys, then all you have to do is, is start a landing page or a blog post beginning with, are you wasting too much time on social media? Well, here's how our, our SaaS can help, you make, can help you do the same thing much easier in much less time. You know, you, you can basically borrow their, their own words. How about, I, I hear a problem, especially for those that are just starting out, they don't know what industry to go after. And so their landing page or website talks to everyone. And that's what I see the problem is because, first of all, they basically speak to no one because no one understands, yeah, like, right? Exactly. Um, but then they themselves do not know which industry to go after. So do you have any exercises to help founders understand which industry to go after, or at least to start exploring a little bit more? Uh, well, yes. I mean, <laughs> you're completely right. If, you're, if you start out writing for everyone, you'll be writing for no one because n no one wants to be, to be part of you know, everyone. Everyone needs to be special. 
and uh, I think that uh, finding the the ideal industry to to work on to work with starts in the um, in the very very early stages of research. Even as you're building your product, you can you can simply use the the same tools that I mentioned earlier, like uh, like surveys and uh, beta testers, to see which of them are a better fit for your product, and to see where you can solve the most problems. Following up on the on the social media example before, you can see a very interesting segmentation for social uh, media marketing SaaS tools. You know, because you could say that they might ca cater to everyone because. Even, even an individual might need help with scheduling their posts on Instagram or Facebook. But in the end, what most of them are doing, and they're doing it in a very smart way, is target marketing agencies or digital agencies, because that's where their, their ideal buyer persona is. Uh, a digital agency needs a lot more help in managing a lot more social media accounts than an individual. So you can see this amazing positioning that comes from their own research, uh, because most of them even have free plans for one account or for three accounts. You can tell that for them, uh, single marketers, I mean, uh, marketers working for a single company or uh, individuals are not an audience that, uh, that they plan to increase their MRR with, you know. But marketing agencies, that's where, that's where their money is. And uh, I think that's also something very important because if you only look at, at what your buyer needs and forget to look at what you need, at what your company needs, then your content marketing might be awesome from from a reader's perspective, but it will do absolutely nothing for your for your bottom for your bottom line. <laughs> it's actually a mistake I did uh, in the early days when I when I launched my my digital agency. I used to write this very in depth post because based on my research, I figured that people don't know that much about content writing and copywriting and what's the difference between them. So we wrote a lot and they were good articles. We started to get a lot of traffic, a lot of organic traffic. And I was stoked about it because I figured that the leads couldn't be that far behind, except that they were, you know, our buyer persona didn't need to be explained what are the stages of, uh, of writing the perfect landing page. What they needed is to, was to hire us. And that's what we also needed. So I, I changed my strategy. And instead of writing about uh, creating the perfect sales page, I moved, I moved to writing how to hire the perfect digital marketing agency. And this, this was the intersection between our needs and our readers' needs. So align, aligning this content strategy with the goal of your business is important, especially do it at the very beginning. And I actually recently interviewed uh, Joel Kletke. He's the founder of uh, Case Study Buddy. And yeah. talking about, he is saying that first you need to identify, even when we're starting writing the case studies, which is such a narrow you know, area of content marketing, right? You still need to start with, okay, what's your goal? Do you really want to target this particular industry? And that's why you want to go after an interview and create a case study with this particular client. So you need to take a step back and think about what's the business goal. So I love it. So we understand, we now know that we need to write the content. We know what kind of content and who our target audience is. How about the process of writing the content? Do you have any recommendations for this stage where do we choose someone internally? Do we uh, outsource that? Uh, it really depends on the size of your team. Well, what I see as, as another mistake a lot of uh, bootstrapping startups do is they take on way too much. There's too much on their plate. We see a lot of founders doing their writing themselves, and that's not ideal because you should be using your time to grow your business, not doing something that can be easily outsourced. And what I found in, in working with a lot of uh, SaaS companies is that besides the, the cost, because it may, it may actually be cheaper to hire someone to do, to do this for you, uh, you get additional benefits. For instance, having an, an outside point of view, someone who, uh, someone who understands your buyer persona from a whole new perspective, and someone who, who finds it easier to get over themselves, you know, is an, is an added benefit. I saw that looking from, from the outside, you can find new benefits of the, of the tool you're writing about. It's, it's much easier to do so when you're not completely investing, invested in creating it. Because as, as the builders of us, you sometimes tend to insist too much on, on the technical aspects. And you forget that you, you're maybe not writing for a technical audience. And this can get in the way. This can get in the way. So <laughs> No, I love it. Actually, just recently, I, I'm hosting a mastermind group. And 
in the group, we, we had uh, one of the founders whose website is so technical, like you just cannot believe how technical it is. And our question to him was, so are you actually talking to those technical people who understand what, you know, this very technical data, data protection is uh, and data security? And he's like, well, yes. And then I started asking questions. Okay, so your target audience is really any kind of business who, so bottom line is his target audience can anyone who is using, for example, SurveyMonkey as a tool. And so those business owners are not aware about those technical things. So there's basically, he's not addressing 95% of the funnel potential audience that he can speak to because his audience is very small and not necessarily searching for anything that he's actually selling. So he would need to educate those people and you cannot educate those people with this such a technical content that you yeah. have. So I like that point. And then about hiring the writer, it's so interesting because when you know who you speak to, when you know the industry that you want to address in your uh, piece of content, then you can actually hire this person who has just that uh, experience working with that particular audience. So for example, if you're writing for a marketing agency, then hire someone who has worked with marketing agencies in the past and can bring you this point of view that you would not know otherwise, right? Or if you're writing for, I don't know, maybe someone who is using let's say Squarespace as a website or like someone who's on Etsy, for example, then you hire specifically who has experience with that. And there's no shortage of uh, talent, right? You go on, the first step for me is always go on Upwork and just post the job and you'll probably get a bunch of people who has had prior experience working with that particular very small industry or niche. So I love that point of view that mm -hmm. hiring a writer is actually bringing someone on board who has more experience in this particular industry than maybe even you do. Yeah, and what, uh, what I also found interesting in, well, I, I recruit a lot of writers for, for my agencies. So what I realized is that it's far more important to get someone who has a marketing or PR background than it is to have someone who has a, a writing background. Because as marketers, we can easily emulate to different uh, tones of voice or we can easily understand the buyer persona. Writers, they may be good, they may have all the commas where they're supposed to be, but they do not know how to write for the web. They're writing essays. So th this is something that you should always keep in mind when, when you look to hire, when you want to hire someone to do the writing for you. Do they also know marketing? Because in the end, the content that they create for you needs to sell. It doesn't need to, uh, to read like a Hemingway novel. Yeah, that's important. And uh, moving to our next subject, uh, content, like implementation and distribution of the content. I see so many founders making a mistake of just writing it and publishing it once, thinking that that's where everything stops and basically Google is going to come and, you know, find your great piece of content, right? And what I, the interesting quote that I've heard is that you need to spend 20 time percent writing the content and 80 time percent of your time distributing this content. Yeah, it's 100% true. Yes, it is because while we all love for Google to discover our latest piece and make us viral in a split second, that rarely happens. And especially if you're a new company that, that no one's heard of, then you need to put in the extra work. And I, I really love going into these not so well-known techniques of promoting. For instance, yes, you can, you can post it on all your social media channels. And I always recommend posting it more than once because not all your audience is online at the same time in the same day. And evergreen content can be posted again and again. Once again, we have tools to help us with that. We don't need to, to do it ourselves manually. But then there are other small things that you can do. For instance, you can answer to Haro pitches on Help a Reporter Out and get links back to your content. Or if you mentioned an influencer or someone in, in your industry, in your latest piece, tag them on, on Facebook, uh, tag them on Twitter, because they will retweet or reshare your post. Everybody loves to be, to be mentioned and be called an influencer. The same goes for using uh, reports and statistics in your content. For instance, you can, there are a lot of companies like Gartner that you can, you can tag. Okay, maybe Gartner is not the best example because they're huge and they maybe will not re retweet you. But uh, other smaller outlets that put out their own research reports that you can use to make your content better are definitely, are definitely eager to, to retweet and to be mentioned and to earn backlinks. So my point is you need to be social with your content. You need, to, you need to make it look like a big discussion about, among experts in the field. 
Very good. How about the frequency of publishing content? Uh, we talked about that, you know, you need to spend much more time promoting the content than writing. But still, let's say that we do all of that. How often would you recommend to publish a content? And is there at all such a thing as, you know, a schedule that you need to adhere to? I believe there is. Yes, you should have a schedule because uh, people are creatures of habit. And if you've, you, you, if you've accustomed your readers or your email subscribers that with publishing a new piece uh, every week or every month, then that new piece should be, uh, should be there weekly or monthly. And um, regarding your first question, the frequency, again, it depends. It, dep it depends on your bandwidth. You don't need to stretch yourself too thin and to publish content every day just for the sake of publishing. Instead of publishing poorly written and thin content that neither the users nor Google love, but doing it often because you read somewhere or heard in a podcast someone saying that you should publish every day, uh, you should uh, be realistic and think about how many topics can you realistically publish per month and still bring value for your business and for your. But once you've set on a number, do try and keep to it. You, you have studies from HubSpot, I think, that say that you should publish 16 times per month in order to get to make a dent in your SEO rankings. And and that's great. Of course, the more you publish, the more uh, the better you will rank, and the more leads you will you will capture. But only if the content is quality content, authority content, or 10x content, whatever you want to call it, it has to be damn good to make a dent in your reputation and your bottom line. So if you're not sure that you can produce 16 pieces of amazing content per month, then maybe cut it down to eight, four, even two. And another trick that you can use if you don't have the bandwidth to promote, to, to create a lot of content, is to repurpose it. For instance, uh, this podcast that we're talking on right now can be transcribed and turned into a blog post because I'm sure some people in your audience would prefer to read it rather than to, rather than to listen. It can also be a video. If you have several podcasts that are, that are on similar topics, you can create an ebook or a white paper that tackles this subject even more in depth. I mean, the options are endless and there are really endless permutations between types of content. And what's great about repurposing is that you can reach more audiences, people who prefer a certain format over the other. And of course, it takes things off your plate. Right. Let's talk about evaluating our efforts and how well those, those pieces of content that we produce are actually doing. How do we know if it's something that we need to continue doing or you know, when is the time for us to say, okay, there's something that we need to do about it because it's not working? Well, I think this could be easily summed up in a single phrase, follow the money, you know, because ultimately you're creating content to, to pad up your bottom line. So if a certain type of content or a certain approach to a certain type of content is not working for you and is not bringing in leads or is not converting, then you should ditch it. You, you shouldn't feel remorseful about it. Even if all your competitors are doing, if it's not working for you, you should ditch it. This is why I, I, always, I always advise our clients, uh, our agency's clients to, to track relevant KPIs. You know, forget about traffic, forget about social media followers. Those are vanity metrics. They will not pay your bills. Instead, look, uh, look at your latest blog post. Did it bring any new leads? If so, how many? How many of them were you, able, were you able to convert with the latest white paper you put out? If you can attach a number to each of your KPIs, then you will know what you can change and uh, what you have to keep in your content strategy because it's constantly evolving. Yes, you need to have a strategy. Yes, you need to research your buyer persona, but you don't need to be dead set on, on those things. You need to accept that your buyer persona will evolve with time, just like your business does. And it's important to make this, uh, these iterations as often as possible. You know what? I think majority of founders, I have a number 90% in my head, just because 90% of founders, I feel like, uh, that's not a statistic somewhere you can read, but I feel like 90% of founders actually don't do it. They do not evaluate their performance of their content. And so they keep producing the same content. Just uh, this week, I spoke to one of the founders. Uh, there are two, two co-founders. And they actually hired an SEO person, an SEO, by the way, that's a very uh, known SEO consultant in the SaaS space. And that person recommended basically to keep producing the pieces of content that they already have on their website without evaluating what they already have. And I think that that's a huge mistake because if you have already, and they had probably like more than a few dozen pieces of content already produced on their website about the same topics that this 
consultant recommended them to work on. And then I basically came in and trying to help them actually implement this feedback. And I said, you know what, I think there's a big piece of this information is missing. And that's, you already have these pieces of content. Let's see what we can do with it. Because well, first, Google likes older content, right? And exactly. Google likes the content to be updated. So if you have an older blog post that you can add more information to, please do that instead of writing a similar piece of content, a new one with the similar number of uh, words, a word count, they update existing piece of content, add as much information as possible. Maybe you have a video, maybe you have an additional statistic, additional screenshots, like all of that, add to your existing piece of content, additional keywords, and then see the difference that that's going to make. So I just yeah. want to uh, share this word of caution is that even their well-known consultants and coaches talk about the things that not necessarily going to be the best bang for your buck. So, and I don't know the solution for you to know how do you know who to trust because there are so many opinions, right? I don't know the answer to that question. Do you? Well, you should trust the numbers. You know, if, uh, if a famous SEO consultant tells you to write more, then maybe ask why and ask for the numbers to, to back up this claim, you know? Because, of course, it's very easy to say, write more. I run, a, I run a writing agency. I want to encourage people to write more and hire us to do it. But in the end, I know that if I, if I do this and people don't get the results, then I'll, my clients will stop com coming back to us. And that's not where I, where I want to go with my business. I think that honesty and relying on numbers are, are the best things that you can, you can do. And you can take a, a page from Joel Kessel, Joel's, <laughs> Joel's manual with the case studies. And, and really, really focus on mining your, your buyers in depth because what Joel is doing with, uh, with his company is pretty amazing. And the case studies that they, they create are actually have the, the ability to bring in new clients because they are very well researched. And again, circling back to, to how we started this conversation, it's all about research and getting to know your, your buyer persona because no matter what your SEO consultant tells you, if you know that your buyer persona doesn't need yet another article on the benefits of social media, then perhaps you should stay away from it. That sounds good. Where can listeners know more about you and connect with you? Well, they can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, and uh, on the two websites that I run, copyrighted.net and uh, iden.pro. Very good. Thank you so much, Adriana. It was a pleasure talking to you. <laughs> Thank you to Natalie. Same here.